Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, coming at you. Very thankful. Very thankful this week to be coming at you with another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Thankful that for as much of the conversation we're about to have, maybe uh, on the, a little less positive side, uh, still get to talk about an above 500 team. But more than any of that, I'm just thankful that I have someone who continues to be willing to come on here and just deal with my bullshit week after week. Uh, that That is deserving of many a turkey and a yam and a... Uh, what else? What's your what's your favorite uh Jeremy Cohen? What's your favorite uh Thanksgiving side? That's a, such a tough question. Cuz you know, I mean, it, it's all about texture, right? You, <laughs> there are different mouthfeels that you want going on in a day. Yeah, you can't just I mean, that's like asking you your favorite child. I can't necessarily do that. I love the mac and cheese element, but you know, sweet potatoes, marshmallow, that's got my heart and I'm sure there are people who are grossed out by that thought. Maybe not in the United States as much, but um it's delicious. Got to get some greens after you feel all sweet corn pudding. I'm actually going to make a corn pudding. So that's probably going to be pretty good. It sounds um, delicious. I've never, I don't Yeah. You mean like corn, corn pudding? It's not like pudding and then you sprinkle like chocolate pudding. You sprinkle corn and I, it's, you know, I gathered as much. It's like cream corn and more corn. And then it's, okay. it's pudding like, so it's good, but yeah. Um, but no, I, I'm thankful that uh, even with my ridiculousness that, you bring me back week after week. I realized as we were logging on that uh, today is the anniversary of JFK. So I'm not going to say anything because I feel like that would be way too disrespectful. Not like I was respectful beforehand, but especially not today. It just popped into my head. Oh my God. I can't believe it. Who is I just, Jesus Christ, Jerry? I swear that wasn't a turn. It really wasn't. It's all staying in. You're not okay. cutting a word uh, of this. Yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, but yeah, well, it's uh, thank. So did, wait, so does that mean I should ditch the which which Nick would be over in the grassy knoll segment of the pod? Um, I think that would be fair. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I am before we get to weekend review, game ball, uh, and of course uh, detention and predictions, and I, I think a special surprise from Jeremy today. Um, speaking of things that uh, we are thankful for, both myself, Jeremy, uh, Andrew, and uh, and Chris Persianen massive, unbelievably huge shout out and thanks to everyone who joined us at Madison Square Garden on Wednesday night um, under false pretenses, because when we picked the game against the Orlando fucking magic, like it's like, OK, come watch a win with your friends at KFS. Right. No, 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 no. And yet all of you still that I saw at least had smiles on your faces as you were leaving. I. Uh, you, just incredibly kind things that you had to say to myself, Jeremy, everybody who was there. And um, it was, I think I, I speak on behalf of all of us here. It was a really special night for all of us to be able to kind of, you know, I mean, we, we've kind of all, we're all part of the same community, but because we, we do it, it via zoom and, um, and much of it is, is, you know, in front of a computer, uh, we don't get to feel that as much. And we certainly did on Wednesday. So that was, um, that was incredible. Uh, Jeremy, anything else you want to add there? Yeah, you said it, John. It was really great to be able to to see people we hadn't seen in a while and um, and see some of you who we just have interacted with in the past, but never got to meet in person. So I did have a great time at the event. It was a sort of thing where I was certainly disappointed with the outcome of the game, but I felt like I still had a really wonderful night. I hope everyone who is in attendance felt similarly. And um, we certainly want to do this again in the future, just a matter of uh, of when and and who will be joining us. So if you're interested, if you went and you want to come back, um, that's awesome. If you wanted to go before, didn't get the chance, uh, that's great too. We'll, we'll figure something out down the line and um, we'll do it again. Absolutely. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good transition, Jeremy. It's not your first rodeo uh, to talk about where where things are are at uh, with this team. So, quick week in review. Um, the week actually got it. How, how long ago does the Pacer game feel like? <laughs> more than a week ago, ago. <laughs> ago. <laughs> more, certainly more than a week ago. Um, that was it was on Monday, yeah. Um, and uh, so the Knicks started the week off beating the Pacers by um, by eight points in MSG, and what was we didn't get a chance to talk about it. Was that their best win of the season? Given all everything surrounding the team, I I, I don't know. It might have been. Depends. I mean, the Boston game talking? was obviously 
big, big kick I, the shit I out of Philly can. with Embiid. Yeah, I can't I can't go with India as, as one of the it's close, I, but I think I think Boston's probably reigning supreme and hopefully the Knicks aren't peaking after that one game. There could be higher <laughs> heights. Uh yeah, peaking after game one is not fun. But uh no. And that Philly game. Yeah, I, I think Boston Philly games and division That's rivals. Fair. But it was it was I, nice to beat Indy after Miles Turner went off uh, for what? Seven of nine from three. And yeah. All that jazz and all that jazz. Um, you know, as I'm just talking about this, it, it now fully strikes me why the so then after that, they lost the magic one oh four ninety eight. Why that magic game was so disappointing, not only because we all came out and it would have been just great to experience a win together, but because, and this gets into the reason why I even pitched to the Pacer game as maybe was it the biggest win of the season, because it felt like after everything that had kind of gone sideways for the previous couple of weeks, that was maybe the game they turned the corner and then the magic game happened. It's like, no, clearly whatever corner we thought we turned, we didn't turn it. And then that gets us to, I'm man. I'm just going to say it. Maybe the, I think it was the worst performance of the season in, in a win. Um, not, or the worst, let me rephrase that. It was their worst performance of the season, maybe period. And it happened to come in a win because of who they were playing. Uh, someone relegate the Rockets. Uh, so the Knicks beat the Rockets one Oh six 99. And then um, it's just, again, it's been a strange week in one of, and we'll, this is where we'll pick up our conversation. And, and I don't want to say one of their better performances of the season, but like, a performance that left you feeling good about some, some things um, they lost to the bulls in Chicago, one Oh nine um, one Oh three. So I will, I will start here. We've been in God. I think when we were in, when we were five and one, we were in concerned, but not panicking stage. Cause it was like, we're five and one. We could be concerned. Right. Um, and we've been in that stage now for, the better part of three weeks. Um, are we still concerned, but not panicking Jeremy Cohen? It's a great question. I feel like this week, the Knicks could have gone four and but I also feel like the Knicks could have even gone. zero and four and Welcome to they, the Knicks. <laughs> they evened out at two and two, but you know, it's the sort of thing where, last week I was saying how I don't really want Tibbs to change anything because of the fact that there's still time. We're still early in the season. And it was also because I looked at an early or an easier slate of games and felt this is the time where you can start to work those kinks out. And then we saw the Pacers game. Not fun. We saw the magic game. Not a good performance. We saw the worst quarter of the season against the Rockets um, in the first quarter. And by the end of that Rockets game, even though I was happy to escape with a win. My mind was like, all right, I, I, I my, my, I'm past my tipping point. I, I would like to see some sort of change with the starting lineup. You, you had hit the iceberg. Exactly. That was kind of my point where it's just, if you can't handily beat a one in 14 team and granted, sometimes those are the teams that can be the most desperate. They're coming to Madison square garden. Um, they had the, the day off earlier. They, you know, they're, they're hungry for a win. They nearly beat the Lakers. They nearly won a couple other games during that stretch. So, um, but the magic, you know, doing it twice in the first 13 or so games of the season, 14 games, that is kind of 15 games, whatever. Um, that's kind of where it was just like, I'm, I'm done now. I could understand it against better teams, but if you can't play up to a certain level against these poor teams, Something's just not working. And but, look, we saw in the third quarter yeah. of the Bulls game, it, things started to click. So mm-hmm. it's possible. Yes, there could be time and, and maybe things just need to gel a bit. But I also just wonder, you know, like how many games can the Knicks afford to have Randall or anyone run the offense and four other players in the starting lineup are in single digits? Um, I, it just, you can't really do it, but it, it then goes back to this thing where the Knicks continuously play down to opponents and then play up to opponents. Because again, we could be talking about the fact that the Knicks were three and one and had just beaten the bulls for the second time in Chicago. And compared to that, losing twice at MSG to Orlando, it's like, this is a very <clears throat> weird, even keeled team that probably is somewhere in the middle. And instead it doesn't feel quite that way. Um, uh. You, you nailed it, uh, as you usually do. It, it doesn't feel, it doesn't, because on paper, and I think 
when you get to what is now the 17 game mark, what a team looks like on paper is, is fair. Uh, it should not be ignored. Still some funky things. Uh, if you look at like net ratings versus record that are going on, that's why you probably need to get to like the 30 game mark to really like, okay, this is what we're dealing with here. You know, any, any funky, funky, small sample sizes with shooting or opponent shooting, whatever like those kind of get, you know, done away with. Um, but they have a winning record. They have the, they are the they have the smallest positive net rating in the league. There's I, I forget who has a dead even net rating, and then they're right above that. I think they've outscored their opponents by like eight points this year or something like something ridiculous like that. Um, so it like it feels like they are Indiana. Thank you is the team with the dead even net rating, Andrew. Um, it feels like they're a team that is on the like if there's a hair going through mediocre, they're on the north side of that hair. And yet I, I want to pick up on something you just said, where it's like, how many games have, have this season have they're gone by where it's like, you felt like five guys played well, forget about eight guys or seven guys or whatever, like five I'm thinking, cause I do that, like the stars of the game. And I think there's been like a couple times this year where I've been like, wow, this is really tough. You know, it's like, I have five guys who are really like, it hasn't happened that much. Usually it's about three, maybe four and someone get one or two guys give a really big performance. And I think if you need an indication of a team that's not gelling, that's your indication, right? It is, is something like that. And then the only other thing I'll say, and I just, I want to look at the schedule real quick while I do this, like how many wins this season can we say that, and this will be a transition to like, uh, we're at this kind of check mark and how many more games do we need to figure out like what this team is. How many games a season do, can we look back on and be like, man, we feel really good about this, this game. So season opener in Boston, that's a no for me. I, 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 why don't you give me your response after, after I go. So that's a no for me. I would say it would have been a yes. If we're looking at the first 46 minutes of the game or maybe exactly. like the, the third, what uh 25th minute or something through the 40. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it is. So that's a no. Um, the first Orlando game. That's, I think it's not obvious. Yes. They, Broke their team record. But again, it came against Orlando. Mm-hmm. Sec- second Orlando game, it's a big no. Uh, first Philly game, that's a big yes. Okay, so we're two and two so far. That Then the first win in Chicago, where they almost gave it away in the last three minutes, I have to say, I think that's a no. Where I'm, I'm just saying, a, a win where you or a game where you're like, I feel great about this. That, 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 that's a no, right? I'm going to go. Yes. The reason being that for 45 minutes or so, the Knicks had the lead and then it just down the stretch was a disaster. And I just, yeah, I understand. I understand that by the way, with the starters that we've now come to learn more stuff about. Exactly. Um, I I just, I know that there was a meltdown, but the fact is the Knicks didn't lose that game. Okay. So I'm going to go with yes, but it it, it was an ugly few minutes of it. A hundred percent. You're kinder than me at New Orleans. Could we agree on a no for that? Even though they came away with the win. See, oh, come this, on. They played like dog well, shit. That no, no, no. What I was going to say, I, I do agree with you, but then the, that was also the RJ. fantastic RJ performance, yeah. which has been lacking. So, you know, obviously. So it's, it's still, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, okay. It's a no, but it was kind of like the, the proof of it, proof of concept. And, um, but that kind of feels irrelevant now. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to, we may get to some more RJ talk later in this episode. Um, Toronto game that they lost. That's a no at Indiana that they lost. That's a no mm-hmm. um, game in Milwaukee where they were, when uh, I, they were, was that the game they were down big in the, or were they up? They yes, were down that, was the big, that was my post game. Now, yes. There you go. Da- down big. And they won. So that's, that's, that's actually a yes for me. That's it. okay. I'll give that a yes. So that's my third. Yes. That's your fourth. Yes. Cleveland. That's a big no. No. <laughs> um, the Philly. So this is, this is the toughest call. The Philly, the game at Philly against the, the Philly injured squad where it was touch and go until the last couple minutes. Second night of back to back on the road. Uh, I'll say I'm yes. Say, I t- okay. I'll say yes. I think that was okay for me. So I'll take the opposite. I'm going to say no. Okay. So we both have four that we're, we're okay with. Uh, the Milwaukee loss uh, when they did come back and almost, but again, they went down by whatever it was 27 points in that game. That's a no at Charlotte. That's a no Indiana game. So yes, for both of us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, magic game. <laughs> Ooh. 
Uh, Houston game. Ooh. And, and then Chicago is the last one. Uh, so I think that's five games for each of us that we felt good about. And did, did you feel good about the Chicago game in total? Bits and pieces, mm. but overall, overall, I would say no. Yeah, I'm going to say no, too. I, I'm, I, and that's and that is where we are have arrived. We're like looking at that game now in we're we're recording this, I guess, a day or so after it, it ended. Like, no, like we we feel OK about that game in light of how we felt about some other games over the last few weeks. But we can't sit here and be like, oh, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're feeling great now. So that's five games for each of us that, that we both fill out of out of 17. That's I think that's why the fan base is is kind of on the verge of panicking. Well, I'll be honest. I said to my roommate as I was watching the game, or we were watching the game uh, against the Bulls. I haven't enjoyed watching a Knicks game in maybe two weeks. Granted, the the Magic game was fun because of the environment and the people and yep. everything. But um, I think, I, I, yeah, I just um, actually it might have even been longer than that, where I just haven't had fun watching this team and it'd be a, a different whole game. story. Exactly. A whole game. There, yeah. there are moments where, and you can appreciate players when they're taking steps forward and uh, like, you know, OB so impactful and, and you appreciate the, and you savor the moments that he has. But, yep. um, but as a whole, it's like, I, I, from start to finish, I haven't genuinely found joy in watching this team. And at the end of the day, that's, that is what we're supposed to do. Um, we're supposed <laughs> to watch it as entertainment, even when things are bad. But I think that's the other thing. Like, again, I didn't expect this team to be great. I expected them to be average to above average, mm-hmm. um, somewhere, you know, 500 to maybe a few games above it. But I, I thought I would at least have fun watching these games, right? Like even last yeah. year, it felt like before the huge win streak. There would be wins that it was like, all right, the team's going to go for it. They got Derrick Rose. Fine. But, let's see where it goes. But Jeremy, then, how many expectations are very different. I, I completely understand that. How many losses did I get on the post game? And I was fucking fired up after yeah. some of those because of how they played and who they played against. Like, man, these scrappy underdogs. They're not. I remember the Brooklyn game where they, they came back from whatever it was, 15 or something down in the last couple of minutes. Like, man, this team really just does not give up. Yeah. And then this season is, you know, it's just not, it's not that anymore. And I think people I, look at the, I'm not um, saying anything uh, crazy, you know, uh, rev- revelatory here. That's why people are, you know, a little fed up. Um, well, uh, Trey Young said something a few weeks ago. Yeah. And he talked about how he felt like, there was there almost like a jaded nature of the team. Like they had overachieved last year and they don't really care about the regular season. I can't get inside the mind of these players, but it kind of feels similarly with the Knicks, but the Knicks had a lot less success than the Hawks did in the playoffs. It felt like they had this great run and instead of capitalizing on it, there's no one who's really taking that, that level of accountability. And yet each player individually does it right. You know, Randall says it's on me. Julia says it's on me. Tibbs, I mean, he's not a player, but he says, you know, it's on me as well. It's not like the players are, are trying to say it's this person's fault or it's not. Um, it's more just, it doesn't feel as cohesive, right? Like everything about last year was the big 15. And now it's just kind of like, oh, this- there are 15 of us, <laughs> but the sum of our parts aren't greater than the whole. And um, great call. It's just something, something's got to give, whether it's internal, external. And it's not going to be external again for at least another few weeks. So um, I'm sure we'll get to that when the time comes. But until then, like, again, the starting lineup, they're in the fifth percentile in points per possession and defense per clean in the glass. <sighs> and can't I get happening. No, it and it's can't. most played lineup in the NBA. Yeah. And you, you dig into some of the numbers with specific. It's, it's just none of it's good. Um, maybe some causes for for hope, not only coming off the, the Bulls game, but some other things as well, which again, I think we'll get to in a bit. Um, So next checkpoint for me. So I always had this like 16 game checkpoint. Next checkpoint for me, I think is going to have to be December 14th. Why December 14th? So um, yes, John, why December 14th? It's the day after my anniversary. Oh, okay. Well, Mazel tov. I thought there was a legitimate reason because I have. One I thought you were like, what you should. Uh, I thought you were saying it like, you well, should go know ahead what and that then I'll, I'll give my can. reason, but. Like, oh, okay. On. So December 14th for me is because that ends a stretch of 11 games in a row where I, you, you know, 
the easy, the quote unquote easiest game of that stretch is a game in San Antonio against the Spurs. Spurs are struggling right now. They've lost four in a row. Their net rating is for shit. Uh, they're four and 11. Their net rating recently is for shit. Their net rating on the year is actually better than that of a foreign and uh, whatever 11 team. Um, but we always lose in San Antonio. So it was like the easiest game of that, of this upcoming. And then there's a lot of other, um, um, you know, games where it's like, you know, Atlanta's struggling, but we're playing in Atlanta, uh, at Indiana, at Toronto. We've lost to both of those teams already. And then the home games are no picket picnic with Lakers, Phoenix, Bulls, Nuggets, uh, Bucks, Warriors. You know, they're, they're nine and eight right now. If they are somehow 500, I, I had been thinking over 500. If they are somehow 500 after this stretch of 11 games, meaning let's just say, um, they could go five and six, right? And still be 500. So that would be 14 and 14. I would consider that, I'm just going to say, I would consider that a, a pretty major accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um, because right now, if I was a betting man, I, I don't know how much I would put on that happening. So that's my that's my date. Why is that date significant for you? Uh, well, after December 14th, comes oh. December 15th. December 15th is also the first date that the Knicks can start moving players. Um, not all of them. There's some with trade restrictions. And again, I'm not suggesting yeah. that that happens. In fact, it's rare. The last guy to go on December 15th was Trevor Ariza. And that was weeks in the making. Um, just wasn't a fit with, I think I want to say Phoenix before he went to Washington. But um, again, like it's, we do also know that the Knicks struck early. They didn't waste any time with Derek Rose acquiring him on February 7th. February 8th, whatever. It was one of the earliest was. significant transactions. And the trade deadline, I want to say, was March 25th. So that was, you know, granted, he missed some time with COVID and, and injury, but that was a month and a half before the deadline when they went out and got him. So they were clearly aggressive and they didn't want to wait too long until that moment. So that's why I'm thinking, you know, it's like December 14th is a home game against the Warriors. Your eyes lit up. Something I know my phone was notified as well. What, what is we, it? We have some breaking news. Um, not hundred percent sure when if it's going to be, but I would assume it's going to be for the next game he plays. LeBron James has been suspended one game and Isaiah Stewart receives two game suspension for their roles in the altercation during Lakers Pistons. Um, Lakers play the Knicks on Tuesday night. So actually a bummer because I'm going to the game and I was really hoping to see LeBron for the you first time You can fuck ever. all the way off. I don't I know give a I shit can. about you and your desires to see well, you never did, two great, okay. or three greatest players of all time. Just, I'll take Which, a gift. I mean, they'll still lose anyway because I'm there. But uh, as we've discussed before, anyways, um, it's a sort of thought process of if something were to happen where the Knicks lose to the Warriors and the next day trades are more possible, you never know. Maybe that's the day they strike. Maybe it's just another day on the calendar and <sighs> contracts are unlocked. I, I, I'm not trying to assume one way or the other. It's just that is that is the day where you can start. I... Hmm. Last season's Rose acquisition, as we remember, when Austin Rivers was right before he was waived and he had the press conference and he's like, yeah, I heard Derek Rose's name bandied about before the season started. Like that thing was in the works for a while. And it was also the most glaring trade on the board in the entire league. Tibbs, Rose, Rose on Detroit. Um, terrible team looking to lose games. Um, worst starting point guard in the NBA. Uh, in need at the position. They don't even really have a backup at that point. Like that was so obvious. I guess I, the only pushback I'm going to give is like, I don't know where the obvious trade is. Um, I don't know who's the obvious guy that is, would be sent out. Um, again, this is not a conversation to be had right now, um, but it, it's yeah. Um, oh, here is Woj making it official. LeBron will miss the next game. So again, Jeremy tough noogies. For you. Yep. I I also looked up like, oh, can a player appeal? No. No. I also There's, thought maybe they would drag this out long enough where, uh, you know, they would be like, oh, we're still conducting our our uh, uh, inter- investigation and, and then let it delay. But they clearly I, wasted no time. Let me be clear. The Knicks could still lose this game. And there's a part of me that still thinks the yeah. Knicks will lose this yeah. game. That's how things are going right now. Um, and I think it would be at the hands of Carmelo Anthony, if I'm being honest, because uh, wouldn't that be just poetic? Uh, okay. On that note, uh, you want to give out some game balls? Let's do it. 
Okay. Um, this is the easiest game ball that I have had to give out uh, all season. Um, I, I am not letting you take this one from me because I have been back in this dude since early last season uh, when he came back from injury. And I'm like, wow, why is Alec Burks like our second most important player? Um, even before that, the like when I was killing time during the, the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, I wrote about Alec Burks as a guy like the Knicks should target this guy. He checks a lot of the boxes that Tom Thibodeau supposedly wants. He can move with the ball. He's, you know, uh, he could shoot threes. Um, and, you know, he's a little bit of shot creation. And I just, I never, I never understood why, like, out of the gate this season when he was like, just off to a cold start, people were ready to like, okay, that's it. We'll, we'll, we'll get rid of him. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me then. And obviously makes even less sense now because where would the Knicks be without Alec Burks? Again, I, he obviously won the Houston game for them. Um, but uh, he has had some other games where he has been a significant figure um, in their wins. So uh, I am giving my game ball to uh, Alec Burks, who is, by the way, shooting 44% from three on eight three point attempts per 36 minutes. Not, not a bad little stat. It has to be Alec Burks. He was the guy this week. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I mean, I would, I would take him. He's taken, I guess. So, uh, I'll go with Obi, you know, as, uh, as our great producer, Andrew Claudio has written this week in 60 total minutes. Obi had 34 points, 19 rebounds, three blocks and had a slash line of 55, 40, 100. Um, you know, I, I think that the way it works with Obi is people see a step forward and then they see Randall sliding back. And then the next feeling is keep pushing Obi forward. Look, just, I think we just enjoy Obi for, for what he is right now. And that's totally fine. I still would like to see him play more than he is, but he's in the role that is right for him right now. And as time goes on, he will, hopefully develop and become even better. But, um, I, you know, again, like what he's doing, the pace, the speed, um, transition offense, the fact that he's also his defense is, is not what it was, you know, build as or he's certainly grown in that retrospect. So, um, I'll go with Obi because he's just, he's just fun to watch and he's can fun I give to you, see play. Can I give you an Obi update? Please so, um, our, our per 36 minute, club of 18 points, eight rebounds and one and a half blocks uh, per 36 minutes. Oh, excuse me. And, and also uh, over at least two assists. Oh, actually, we sorry. We get up this to now two blocks. OB is averaging two blocks for 36 minutes. Perfect. So two blocks, two, uh, two assists, eight boards and 18 points for 36 shooting above 50% from the field. We have company. It's no longer OB Toppin and Anthony Davis on an Island by themselves. Do you want to know who has joined them? Who, John? Giannis into the Kupo. <laughs> I wish I was making this shit up. Yeah. And and if we if we take away the above 50% field goal, uh, this is going to get fun. If we take away the above 50% field goal shooting, there are two other names on the board. Uh, that would be uh, Joel Embiid and um, one Kristaps Porzingis. So interesting collection yeah. of five names there. Yeah. Uh, it was a good choice. Obi Toppin. Very, very nice choice for you for your for your game ball of the week. Uh, I wish I I wish I every every year I feel like I've been like analyzing this team. There's always one subject where I'm like, I really wish I had something much smarter to say about this thing when people bring it up. And that thing this year is why is Obi Toppin not getting more minutes? And um I really the only thing I always go back to is he doesn't want to extend overextend Randall at the five and he doesn't trust Obi at the five. And like, I get those things, but then you had it last night where, uh, or sorry, the, the Chicago game where they were going small and he had a chance to give Obi a little bit more run at the four. And he instead went with RJ who, you know, was very good on defense and that perimeter defense against those two behemoths out there on, you know, with the bulls. I, I, I get that. So again, it's defensible, but it's like, man, the kid just brings so much. I I love Obi Toppin. Okay, um, do you want to go first for detention, or would you would you like me to go first? No, I can go first. Um, Please. So I'm actually going to go with a name that's not written on our Google Doc. Um, I'm going to go Tibbs. I'm going to have Tibbs in detention. 
do you want me to give you your walking papers from this podcast now, or do you want me to wait until after we? I don't done recording. I don't know why it's heresy to to have fault with the person who's in charge of lineups. <sighs> I'm just saying. Listen, I I think that you just talked about Obi needing more minutes. Yeah. That's that's a coaching adjustment, right? I, it's I one coaching adjustment that we spend a lot of time on because I, I I think in in small part because he is so much fun, but he's also so energetic right. and he brings sure. something to the team that nobody else brings. And I, I get that. But we also just discussed the fact that the starting lineup has played the most minutes of any five man rotation in the NBA and is in the fifth percentile defensively. And the offense, I think, is in the 31st. Oh, they're horrible. Um, they're horrible. Right. Uh, listen, it's, you, can, here. you can praise Tibbs and say he's a great coach. Not no. you, but it, one in general. It's warranted. I'm just, let me just right. say, for, for, for it is warranted. I, I just don't know. What, do you have a, a suggestion? Do you have like something where you're like, I wish Tibbs would have figured this out by now? Is it just like, I wish he would have figured out how to make the starters play better together? I, I, I just don't know where. I don't know. I think he's been a little bit better recently in terms of the matchups that he's had um, mixing and matching some of uh, the rotations, mm -hmm. but I think he's also staying with guys a bit too long. Um, and then he's got the quick hook for others. And uh, you know, it's a sort of thing again, where we could say that um, Tibbs will forget more about basketball than I'll ever know. And that'll be a hundred percent accurate. And yet I feel like we also don't need to necessarily compliment someone in order to just critique them where if he's well. saying that, some that this is on him. And again, as we mentioned, players can say that too. But last week, I think I, I said all the starters. Um, this week it's gonna be the person who's putting the starters in the position that they're currently in and how they're using them. Um, and now, John, I, I have a surprise. I can do it now or I can do it later. It's whatever you want. Oh, Jesus. I'll do it. I, I can do no. it after your your thing. No, you could just it might take a little bit of time. I'm I'm I can't wait now. So just go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't want to do it, but well, I don't believe that for a second. No, no, you should. Cause it, it's more like, I didn't think I would have to be in this position. Uh, and I don't have to, it's just, it's kind of like at the point where I feel like I'm sort of obligated to do it. Um, so here's, uh, as I talk it up, um, as I bring it to life, but basically this is what we're looking at. We are looking at, <laughs> If I can figure out how to present it. There we go. Are those? Oh, they're elephants. They're not elephants. Those are bing bongs. Those are bing bongs from inside Is out. That a, it's a character named bing bong? Yes. You've I never seen Inside Out? Your children haven't seen Inside Out? No, I've seen most of Inside Out. I just forgot that that character had, was in, yeah, anyway. Yeah, okay. that's bing bong with a bunch of uh, emoji X's. This is for Evan Fournier. Um, so I'll, I'll get to, and I'll do it now. I, I think that a big reason why things also seem so difficult is because the Knicks aren't getting much out of Evan Fournier. I don't think Evan Fournier is being optimized very well. Um, it's a sort of thing where Fournier, every single year for the last five years, his frequency at the rim has declined. Now, that's not a tips thing. It's a Fournier thing. That's concerning. Um, but he's also finished at the, the rim well, too. So you'd like to see him do that. But ideally, he is the type of player who can catch and shoot. But that's not what he does. He's not a catch and shoot player. He's someone who can pull up, who can create, who can make plays for others. And it feels like when you consider the fact that his catch and shoot numbers are higher pretty much than I think the, the, the second highest um, of any of the five seasons beforehand and, and what's going on, that's a problem. Well, and they're trying to make him more like Reggie Bullock, not to the point where he is Reggie Bullock, right? Reggie Bullock, I think last year, 62% of his shots were on the catch and shoot. Uh, um, Fournier is closer to like, I think 37, 38, but it's still a very high amount. And it's something that he shouldn't be. And that is pretty much a problem because of the fact that when it comes to coaching, he's basically being told to stand in, in spots and, and be more of a, of a spot up guy. And that's just, not who he is. And that so, also goes to coaching. So before we get into this cap or no cap that you have sprung on me so, vi so violently, 
Is this going to be about trading Evan Fournier or is this no. going to be a, okay. No, it's not going to be about trading Evan Fournier. Okay. Um, I just, but this is going to be completely about the, the shift of how Evan Fournier is used. No, it's not. Going oh, to be wow. Anyway. Okay. That I'm, I was just, I was just using the Evan Fournier factor because that was like the introduction to what I'm about to talk about. Oh my goodness. Okay. Because now of the I'm, fact that I'm he's really not scared. being optimized. Um, so here's the thing with Evan Fournier. I've, I've seen on the interwebs, you know, concerns about him and what the Knicks should, shouldn't do, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to talk about what they did and why they did it. Cause I don't think I went into exact detail or as much as I, I should have, I thought I had, but maybe I didn't. So um, I'm going to go in a little bit more on, on this situation. So this is his contract, right? Um, the Knicks wanted to operate as an above the salary cap team in 2022. It was very clear based on how they made their contracts where they don't anticipate dipping below the salary cap. And so as a result, that means signing players to contracts that go into 2022. Yeah. Um, but even if the Knicks wanted, or if they didn't want to be above the salary cap, right? That would mean kind of one-year balloon deals or, or trading for someone. The options just weren't there. Every player that's earning $10 million or above next season received multiple guaranteed years, except for Kelly Oubre and Danny Green. Kelly Oubre is not a two-guard. Um, He's having a a better season, but he was a two guard last year with Steph Curry. It was abysmal. Didn't work. Um, Danny Green's the other one. I I think he's 34 years old. So his is fully non-guaranteed. But if you thought like, again, give someone else who can do the job, just that one year deal, and then you can be below the salary cap. Um, Trading for a guy like Gary Harris. Well, Gary Harris has been terrible. He's stunk. Yeah, Um, he's not good. Torrey and Prince. He's not not a two guard either. But He's not what you need. He's not. And the Wolves clearly wanted that. Um, so again, it's the sort of thing, like if you think Evan Fournier is a starter, which he is, if you don't think so, I'm telling you, he's a starter. He's a starter. And you have to compete with the market rate. And the market rate was multiple years. And if it was multiple years and you're signing Kemba Walker because he's pretty much the best point guard for what you need in the starting lineup, not named Derek, not named Derek Rose, um, and you sign him to two years because that would be the length of his contract that he was just bought out for, you're basically saying we're committed to going above the salary cap, which is fine, which is totally fine. But John, before I continue, do you have any thoughts? Well, I I think I see where you're going with this. And I I just want to, you know what? I'm going to save my thoughts. I want you to keep going with this because I I do have some thoughts on Fournier. Continue. Sounds good. Um, So of course, then the thought is like, who are you spending your money on in 2022? And I'm just going to list names. I'm not going to go into details yet. Players with player options, Bradley Beal, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Russell Westbrook, unrestricted free agents, Zach Levine, restricted free agents, DeAndre Ayton, Miles Bridges, Colin Sexton. Those are kind of like the big eight names. Just keep that in mind as I continue. This, if you are watching, is what the Knicks salary cap situation looks like if the Knicks don't sign Evan Fournier and instead roll that money over in whatever way, right? I mean, if the Knicks went through the Gary Harris or Torian Prince route, we'd be saying this is a disaster. The Knicks just like had all this ability to spend on a decent that, player and they agreed. didn't do it. If the Knicks didn't acquire either of those players and just let the cap space roll, we would be saying hypothetically, if the Knicks are around where they're at now or even worse, um, why did the Knicks not spend money? Do they not care about investing in the team? Last year, I understood. This year, they've got to learn how to use cap space. Can't keep letting it roll over. But again, if we're if we're looking at these numbers projected yeah, and the Randall projection for what it's worth is half of the likely bonus, because as of right now, he's not making an all defensive team. He's not probably going to make the all-star team either. So that's 65 games played plus the playoffs. Uh, but let's just focus on 2022, 23. It would be $21.7 million of cap space, give or take. That's all they would have next season. They would they have not signed for yet. Correct. That's also okay. including uh, their own first round pick, which I said at 15, didn't include the Hornets pick if that conveyed. Uh, okay. So keep that, that 21.7 million in mind. Next, let's go back to these names. Bradley Beal. Why would he leave? He also can't play in New York City as a home team yeah. player anyway. So, uh, you know, Wizards are doing fine. He can get a 35% max contract, which is for 10 plus year veterans, 8% raises with Washington. They're doing well. Cross him off. James Harden. Cross him off. I mean, yeah. Kyrie Irving, please God, let's cross him off. Kyrie Irving's going to get crossed off. If anything, he might just take the player option and then wait for the mandate to hopefully yeah. be rescinded and then go for another max. Uh, uh, Russell, Russell Westbrook, Westbrook. I would choke on my own vomit. 
Yep, me too. He's also going to take the player option because why would he leave LA yeah. and that much money? Next, Zach Levine. We're max. looking at a really good Bulls team. He's going to get the max exactly. Yes. Uh, you don't have max money. You have $21.7 million. Max money, as we saw, is for him, 35.7. You get creative. doesn't even matter because of the fact that he's going to resign. The Bulls look like a really good team and he's probably going to commit to them. Yep. So now we're looking at three restricted free agents, right? We've gone through the unrestricted free agent stars. And now we're looking at restricted free agents. Okay. So DeAndre Ayton, $21.7 million. Hey, Phoenix, uh, we're going ma- you know, to send an offer to DeAndre Ayton. Phoenix is going to say, okay, cool. We're going to match. He, okay. he already turned down uh, a three-year max. He ain't signing for 21 and change. Yep. Miles Bridges. Um, hey, Charlotte, we're going to extend a match, a, a mat, you know, some sort of $21 million offer your way. No. Hmm, okay. Uh, yeah. Charlotte, we are going to, or, you know, this is from Charlotte's perspective. We're definitely going to let Miles Bridges go when we're not a free agent destination outside of Gordon Hayward and like Ish Smith, Tony Parker, and Al Jefferson. No, they're going to retain him. And then you've got Colin Sexton who is out for the season. We don't know what he is. Um, that's a really big investment in a player who's coming off of a knee injury. And again, we just don't know what he's like. Those are all problematic things. And before you know it, I've gone through these eight headliners yeah. and the Knicks still have all of this money to spend and nothing really to do with it with this list of players because they're all very logical reasons for why it's not happening. So this is what the, uh, the amount looks like. Basically, again, just want to show you if they didn't spend $21 million, now focus on 2023. It says that the Knicks are above the salary cap, even if they didn't spend, right? So if the Knicks didn't spend money on Fournier and, and then, you know, because of RJ's cap hold, they're now above the salary cap with factoring in Mitch's extension, all that. Even if RJ is making a max, which at this point, I mean, doesn't seem likely after all. Um, yeah. There's still either there two things are going to happen. One, they'll be above the max, or, excuse me, above the salary cap, which is what they in real life are anyway. Uh, or two, they're not above the salary cap, but they're so little under it that it doesn't even matter. And that's the point. This this off season, as, especially with everything drying up, and we saw other players get extended, and the 2022 off season get far worse. Um, this is your window to lock in players that you can then flip later because you're not going to be able to do that in 2023 and the talent's not there in 2022. So that is why you have to do it. And then you look at sign and trade, right? If we wanted to do a sign and trade, look at what happened this past off season, gotcha. 2021. So, so you're saying now for, sorry, for you're, you're now discussing the possibility of sign and trades in 2023. No, I, I'm, I'm still saying 2022 as an example. Okay. I, look, you could say any year moving forward, but the, the reason I'm saying that is if you look at the contracts or the players who are signed and traded, you'll see an interesting trend. So if you see okay. Kyle Lowry, he was traded for Goran Dragic, Precious Achua, okay. Marta Rosen, Thaddeus Young, Al Farouk Aminu, and some picks. Good Lonzo pick. Ball. Good, good guy, yeah. Thomas Sadoransky, Garrett Temple, a pick and cash. Evan Fournier, cash. Spencer Dinwiddie, four-team trade, matching salary. Devontae Graham, three-team trade with matching salary. John, of these six, what stands out to you the most? Um, I, well, there's one Fournier, glaring difference. Fournier was the only one that was traded for cash considerations. Everybody else it. had, everybody else had players coming back. Yeah, that's or exactly picks. it. And picks. Mm-hmm. Or, or if they didn't, regardless, they, they still had some sort of salary that needed to be. Yeah. Made. And, and that is the bottom line that I understand that things are not going well with Fournier right now. But as I said, he's not being optimized. It's not fun to watch that happening. Um, But it's not like there's this huge opportunity cost to signing him and it's this outrageous contract and they can't move him or anything like that. You can move players. Again, I would say the Bulls would do the DeMar DeRozan sign and trade, giving up picks and Al Farouk Aminu having to attach a little bit more to get rid of his contract uh, 11 times out of 10. And it's worth it for them. I mean, why wouldn't it be? So that is a, a huge reason for why it's not like, oh my God, the Knicks shouldn't have signed anyone. No. Again, if you have questions, I think I may have actually skipped this slide. Yes, I did. The Knicks needed floor spacers and creators in the backcourt. And this is the list of guys in 2021, right? So Lonzo it's rest- for, let's look at restricted first. Yes. Lonzo Ball. 
Again, if you want to say that the Knicks should have gotten Lonzo Ball over well, Evan Fournier, I hear you. But but the thing is that there's a reason why the Bulls are under investigation for tampering. It, like how how feasible was it for the Knicks to get Lonzo? And if they did, are they tampering as well? Because we know that teams tamper. It's just a matter of how blatant it is to set off alarms. And this clearly set off alarms, right? Yes. I'll have more thoughts on this in a second, but keep keep going. Next is Duncan Robinson. I know you are a big Duncan Robinson fan, but if you're Duncan Robinson and a team is offering you four years, a hundred million dollars or so, and they are in Miami and they're a good team, you're going to stay there. Yeah. It was, it was pretty clear they weren't getting Duncan. So right, Gary Trent Jr. resigned. Josh Hart resigned with a funky deal because no one tried to pry him out of New Orleans. And he's also not a floor spacer. So exactly, um, unrestricted free agent Norman Powell. I mean, how desperate were the Blazers? They gave him five years, giving yep. five years to a non-star. That's crazy to me. But they did it. They had to. They were yeah. their backs were against the wall. Because if they lost him, then they'd have to probably trade Dame sooner than they may have to. Um Tim Hardaway Jr. It's not gonna happen. It, no. Like just not. Again, Kelly Oubre Jr. No. Talked about that. Wasn't logical. And then there's Reggie Bullock. And and it goes back to the whole thing here, which is that Fournier is playing more of a Reggie Bullock role. But Evan Fournier is being paid at a premium. And, and he's not doing what he should be doing. And the defensive side isn't there either, where at least Bullock was leading the charge, so to speak. So if you're not having someone who's a plus on defense, which is fine if your offense can do better, but his offense can't. And so as a result, by can't, I mean, it's not. It's not right of, again, now. how he's being used. Uh, and I, I, look, he's missing open shots. RJ's missing hey. open shots. It's, it's happening. It, it's, it's whatever. But uh. the point being here where it feels worse because at least you'd have someone on the defensive end, which would mask your woes there, but it's not. And so the defense isn't working and the offense isn't working and the money is a lot more. And so it just feels like this disaster. But I'm telling you, it's not because of how things are structured, because of what's coming down the pike, because of the fact that it would be a missed opportunity not to do something. Again, you can look at these names and say, I wanted one, this, that, or the other. I hear you. But I feel like as, as we're talking it out, and I'll let you get in on this as well, there are such logical reasons for why players on this list did not work or don't work or couldn't work. And I, again, like the Knicks needed to do something. I respect the fact that they're operating over the cap. I said it as such this past summer. This is how you do that. And contracts can also get better over time. So it's, it's the sort of thing where right now in the thick of things, it doesn't look fun. But I'm telling you, if you can see the forest for the trees, it's a lot better than that. So first of all, I appreciate the effort on this because that was good. Um, I also very much agree with you on the 48 contract being an asset um, and a necessary asset and arguably the best use of their resources at the time to spend that much money on a guy who can do the things that he can do, who we're not seeing him do those things in full force right now, because I think in part because of how he's being used. And I think also in part because of his difficulty adjusting to what he's being asked to do and more specifically what he's not being asked to do. And Fournier actually spoke to that this week when he's like, look, I used to be able to whatever, I forget what his exact words were, but something along the lines of like, I used to be able to play 30 minutes a night and jack up however many shots I was going to jack up and then figure out the rest later. And now I don't get to do that anymore. And it's, and he said it's an adjustment. And the fact that he acknowledged that openly lets me know that it is really bothering him. And despite that adjustment, the guy's still shooting, you know, on decent volume, whatever it is, 36 and a half percent from, from deep, um, you know, making some good plays. He's like, he has not been the glaring negative for me. And I'll save my last thoughts on some of the other possible options, but just, and this would be a good transition to my detention. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I mean, because I, 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 I will continue to praise this group, but this is, this isn't a detention as much as it is. It is a, you know what? I want you to sit with your journal for an hour and just write your thoughts down about some things. And it is to the front office 
because here's where I've arrived at 17 games into the season. And this is why I'm putting the front office, not on blast, but like I'm at least acknowledging the fact that they may have overlooked something here. Kemba Walker spent the entire, his entirety of his career up until the last couple of years being the guy with the ball. And even in the last couple of seasons, he's kind of taken turns being the guy with the ball in Boston. Evan Fournier, pretty much the last five, six years, he's the guy with the ball on the perimeter, him and Vooch, but it's he's in the top two. Randall, we saw what he did last year. RJ was the guy with the ball for his entire youth career up until college. And then um, it's been an adjustment the last two seasons. Dude, still put up a ton of shots. So now you have these four players coalescing on the team together, expected to be the four starters. And it has not worked. And it hasn't, it, it's not that they can't do it. It's not that any of the four can't do it because we've seen all four players this season at times do it, which is why I will continue to push back on anybody who says, oh, Fournier is a bust. He can't. No, we've seen Fournier have great games. He was five for 10 from deep the other night. They wouldn't have won the Houston game without him. Um, Kemba Walker has had a lot of moments this year where he's looked pretty darn good. It is, it is not working as a whole because these guys have all, I think been asked to sacrifice and maybe some are less willing to sacrifice than others. And maybe it's going to take, I, I don't know what it's going to take, but the answer they seem to find against Chicago was more Julius, less of everybody else. That's fine. Um, for now, we'll see how it goes. But like, that is something that obviously was not perhaps considered enough. And I, I don't know where the other obvious move was. I mean, DeMar DeRozan's obviously he's going to get MVP votes. I was on the DeMar DeRozan train all last season. At the same time, it's like, I don't know that I just wanted another guy who was like, oh, you're just going to run your offense through him half the time and Julius half the time and think that that's necessarily going to be better. Because I, I honestly, I'm not 100% sure it would have worked as well here. Lonzo, the other guy, maybe a little bit of a different story. A guy who doesn't need the ball, hit spot up shots, defend his ass off. Um, you know, again, there was a reason Lonzo Ball was number one on my free agent wish list last season. This front office had a vision for a team that was going to jump into the not good offensive category, but the elite offensive category. And that has not happened. And they were willing to make the trade off on defense and it hasn't added all up yet. Um, this is a long winded way of saying nothing at all, because I'm not going to be like, Oh, the Fournier signing was bad. The Kemba signing was bad. I'm just saying that there was an idea here and it was a very purposeful idea. And the very first thing that I wanted to say in regards to Fournier was like, it's not just about the contract. It's a guy who could pull up, who could put the ball on the floor, who could be a spot up shooter, who could do all of this different shit, who could isolate a little bit. Not many guys who could check all those boxes. He's a guy that check all those boxes. They got him for $18 million a year. That is objectively a good contract. It is the complexion within the system that is not working. And, you know, I, 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 I think that in the in the back of your mind, talk about the you spoke spoken. It, you know we've spoken about the things in, that exist in the back of our mind. I have to think at the back of your mind during that presentation, you're already thinking about well, that trade that contract is going to be a tradable asset very soon. Am I am I not, John? I I mean you know me. I think about it the moment it pen hits paper, the moment yes, that I it's tweeted do. out. So listen, I want I want to say I do fully agree with you. Um, I've been super complimentary of what this front office has done because I think that from a from a decision making, it's not like they've veered course. They have stuck to their guns. And I yes. think the way that they're getting there and the philosophy behind it is all very sound. But I think what you're saying in terms of the defensive drop off for the offensive improvements, a hundred percent. It's kind of like this team sometimes feels like it's held together with Elmer's glue. And you're just <laughs> hoping it gets you there. And it doesn't. Um, it also sometimes feels like your awkward teenage years. It feels gawky and uncomfortable yeah. because here's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at players who are developing. I, I, look, I know what RJ is doing. It's not good. It's worse. I think maybe it's prisoner of the moment syndrome, but it's worse than what, how it felt last year when he had that stretch of games where he couldn't hit a three to save his life. Can we just, Worst shooter in basketball over the last eight games amongst guys who have actually played 
a decent number of minutes. And that is exactly. not, that is not hyperbole. That is literally the worst shooter of basketball over the last eight games. Yeah. And I just, I'm trying to look at it. And the reason I say the gawky teenage years is because you have these young players, right? You have Emmanuel quickly, you have Obi Toppin. Um, you still have Mitchell Robinson. You have RJ Barrett. You're trying to work them in and develop them with a winning team, right? It's not like tank, and then let's build organically. And by organically, I mean solely through the draft, right? There are yeah. good players around them to help lift them and say, this is the culture we're bringing in. This is the buy-in. We are, the Knicks have looked like a basement dwelling team for years. They have picked horribly. Like we could keep doing that and maybe pick better because the best thing this front office has done, in my opinion, um, has been with draft development. Um, I mean, we've got two test cases right now or case studies with Manuel quickly and Obi Toppin. Uh, I'm again, fine with Grimes and McBride coming along more slowly. Uh, I think that people may tend to sometimes push players ahead because it's, it's new. Um, they want to see them play. I want to see them play too, but the timing has to be right as well. And if the timing's not right, then they can wait a little bit. Rokas Yakabitis is killing it overseas. So they're, they're executing in some manner. It's just Right now, they're basically saying we could either be really bad or we could be an average to above average team. And they chose the above average to average yep. window, which is fine because, again, it's this isn't their ceiling. If, if you're talking about guys who are 21, 22, 23 years old, your window is, is far from now. In fact, it's probably not for another three to four years. I'm not saying don't go in on a star in three to four years or anything like that. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But but yes, the front office, in my opinion, it's kind of just been like a, a wing and a prayer that this year goes fine. And then they can well, start making moves as as players uh, get better as time goes on. But when I say wing and a prayer, I don't mean like there was more intentionality. It, it wasn't just like, well, we got money to spend. This seems like a decent enough idea. Let's do this for this year. I think it was a little bit more. I think they really had high hopes that this team could be a 50 win team. I guess I, I don't know. From, from the defensive side, money. not not from the, cause the yeah, offense again. They, sure. Yeah, they, they know what they like, but yeah. defensively, it's it hasn't worked out. But here's the thing, right? We thought that the first winter with the Leon Rose team, um, it didn't feel great. It felt good. You know, I mean, well, it felt fine. The second second round picks were nice, but it also and I certainly liked at the time because it was like, when's the last time the Knicks have done this? Um, and, and they certainly traded back. They trade. I mean, they did all sorts of creative things that we would have done. Right. And yeah, and it's fun. And they did that and they were creative and and that felt good, but it really took into, it took a mid season trade with Derek Rose to turn things around. Yep. And it's the sort of thing where in the short term, maybe some of these things don't look great, but then you cash in long term. And, and that's why to me, it was just like hold court this year. You don't have to be as good as you were last year, but just show consistency. Well, and the only thing that they're showing consistently is that they're inconsistent and it's not fun. So that's it you, you summed it up. Fantastic. Um, the last thing I want to say is to all the people out there who are like, Oh, they should have kept Reggie and, and elf. No, I, I, they needed to, they needed to diversify this offense. They needed to at least attempt to stay, take a step forward in a real cognizable way this season. And I think the Fournier part of it is not, the issue because they needed that other wing who could do more stuff. And quite frankly, they have needed RJ Barrett to take a step up and he has not, he has taken a step back. So I think to everybody who's, who's actually uttered the words like, Oh, maybe we're missing Alfred Payton. No, you can't exist in, in the, in the modern age today with a point guard who can't shoot a three unless he is otherworldly at other things. Um, and Alfred Payton was not otherworldly at other things that said, if there was an opportunity to get a less ball, a, a less ball dominant point guard or a, a point guard whose value, because Kemba Walker's value is by and large when he has the ball, like, yes, he could still spot up. But as we've seen through 17 games, like that's, he's much more comfortable taking it off the dribble. He's like, he is not the guy who is go, who wants to be fourth in the pecking order. And he is not actually putting aside whether he wants to be, He's not the guy who operates best when he's fourth in the pecking order. That is not like his best moments of season have come when it's like, okay, let's let Kemba run the show. And I just wonder what the team would be looking at like right now. If it was like, you know what, Julius, you're going to still do what you're going to do. We're going to give you one more fun toy to play with Evan Fournier. And then we're basically going to upgrade the Alfred Payton role, but keep it in that, keep in that archetype. Um, 
not a great three point shooter. Speaking of the Spurs, but it's why I mentioned in the newsletter last week, a guy that boy, if he ever hit the market, I'd be really interested in taking a look at, at DeJounte Murray and what it would take to get him and just be a, have a guy who all literally all he does is drive on offense and, and shut down the other team's um, best perimeter player on defense. Like that's the guy that if you put him on this team, it makes a lot more sense given what we're seeing, even though we can't shoot threes that great yet, but um, okay. I think we did this one justice. Uh, you have a detention you want to give out before we move on to predictions. I did. I, I said it would be tip. Oh, you, okay, great. Oh yeah, that's right. The, the tips. I, but it's, but sorry, that, that conversation lasted a while. <laughs> What do you do to me, Jeremy? Uh, okay. Uh, this is where it gets, uh, we're going to rush through this because it's nothing I want to mention or talk about. Uh, I haven't uh, won a prediction segment yet. I am 0 and 4. Jeremy is 4 and 0. Uh, we'll skirt past that fact and just uh, let Jeremy predict this week's games, uh, which come against the LeBronless Lakers on TNT. Uh, the <laughs> winners of, by the time you listen to this, maybe 13 games in a row. Uh, Cause I think they're playing, they are playing the Spurs tonight, uh, Phoenix suns. And then back to the scene of the crime going into Atlanta on uh, what is that? The Saturday after Thanksgiving. All right, Jeremy, you're going to give me a chance to get my first win of the season. What are you, what are we doing here? I'll tell you, I, I was really hoping that you would be, the one picking first today uh, because it would have meant that the Knicks had beaten the Bulls. Yeah, they were. Uh, it didn't happen. I don't want to go one and two, but I, I'm going one and two. I mean, think about it. This is a, a tough I, I have three-game stretch. <laughs> I'm sure you have. I have thought, um, as have you. Yeah, listen, the, the Lakers are also in in turmoil. In the several, I, I would rather be a Knicks fan right now than a Lakers fan. I will tell you that. Um, but I don't know of, about that. Oh, I do. You you have a window with what's supposed to be one of the best players in the world who's 36 years old and, and hasn't been healthy and now is suspended for punching a second-year player or elbowing a second-year player in the face. Anthony Davis, who is shooting abysmally from three, and he's still like, I, I think elite players are ones who can carry their teams. And uh, I think Anthony Davis is showing that he's not really up to par in doing that. I, Russell Westbrook, who is a great individual talent, um, but it's not clicking for them. And when you look at like the fact that they've traded their picks, they've gone in on this core. They could have also done other moves like Buddy Heald instead. Well, they could have kept a lot of it. Uh, they've taken a misstep and they're yes. wasting precious time, whereas the Knicks, their window is really not even open because they're not a contending team. So I'd yeah, rather that be win- a Knicks fan right now. That window is never guaranteed to be open. It's not, but it's like it's pretty the, depressing where the Lakers are at right now. The Lakers turned the, around, but the Lakers have a window, and they, um, I, I don't even know what, and they and they've gotten stuck in it because of their own um, hubris with the with the Rustbrook thing, which is why LeBron, the player, should fire LeBron, the GM, um, for making that absurd trade. Yeah, but I think in this case, it is better to have never loved at all than to have loved and lost. <laughs> Sounds like a JFK line. Um, okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to go two and one. Um, I said three and one last week and I said, I felt good about it. And in retrospect, you know what? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be that mad at myself because they were, it was close. They were close to going three and one. It was, and as you said, four and all wasn't completely out of the realm. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go two and one this week. Um, I think if, if you were a betting man, you'd bet one and two, but I'm happy to go two and one and we'll see if I can get my, my first win of the season here. I hope so. uh, all right. I'm really happy. We had that, that 40 discussion because I, I think that's the close. I've been thinking, I God, I really have been thinking about this team way too much lately. <laughs> it's probably yep. why I'm, I'm dead tired and just trying to figure out what the, what is, what is in the water, what has poisoned the well. And I, I think we're, we're starting to figure it out, but um doesn't mean it has to stay that way. It just means it, it's going to be more of a challenge than a lot of us thought. Okay. Uh, Andrew, you there, buddy? What's up, guys? Not much. Just I'm say here. hi before we get out of here. You have anything you want to chime in on? I have two things just as a, as a reaction to today's episode. First of all, Jeremy, Christmas came early. A cap or no cap out of nowhere. Thank you for that. I, I, was, I was missing something in my life over the last two or three months since the summer. And it wasn't until today 
that I, that I realized what it was. So thank you for, for that. I'm sure the listeners will agree with that. And speaking of your cap or no cap, I just, part of me also died inside when John had no idea who Bing Bong was. And as somebody who <laughs> has been diving into Pixar movies this week, this, you know, as what was a, was a bit of a, a heartbreaker that you were not aware of or, or not as aware as I thought you should have been about I, one of the main characters of inside out. I think I, ju- I think I still haven't watched the end of that movie and I've tried to, I've started it twice. That was like Pixar's always got these adult themes yeah, for the parents for these alleged kids movies. And I think inside out was the first one where the kids were enjoying the colors, but the movie was made for like a, adults to go through therapy throughout the movie and think back to their. Oh, core see, that was whatnot. that was soul for me. I really enjoyed soul. That's oh, probably my, after that inside might be out. my favorite mm-hmm. uh, Pixar movie. So, yeah. Um, anyway, sorry about that, Andrew. It's OK. I forgive you. And I will echo what you guys said at the beginning, even though I, I wrote it down. So technically, you guys echoed what I said at the beginning. Uh, thank you to everybody that joined us on Wednesday in the suite. It was just really cool to interact with with you guys, not on the Internet and in person. And, uh, you know, I, I know the state of the team could be better, but I am excited to hopefully talk about a team that is not as bad in the couple of weeks when they figure this out. So, um, can I ask you a question? Yes, go ahead. Did we screw up by not covering Mello's return to the garden on this episode? No, because Mello never left in my heart, John. Oh, so Jesus at the end of the day, we, we, he's returned three times at this point. He came back with OKC Listen, I, and lost, came back with Portland and lost. And guess what I'm predicting is going to happen tomorrow night? I just I, they I know win we, because I'll be there. Yeah, because <laughs> I just know people still have an emotional connection to this guy. I saw mm-hmm. his, his comments where some some bullshit about like, yeah, my heart's always going to. I don't know. Whatever. It's not bullshit. But the comment okay. was, is that Look. he never left New York. That That's bond okay. will never be broken. That's great. Because I, I remember I, I remember literally celebrating at the top of my lungs at my daughter's one year old birthday party when that trade was announced. Mm-hmm. Um, it was finally I mean, it had to happen at that. Yeah, point. Let's, to be fair, even if you are a huge mellow fan, it was so arduous to have to go through every yes. day of like, is he going to go to the Clippers? Is he going to go to the, the Rockets? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the and finally, it's just he's gone. We can move yeah, okay. on. There's closure. I feel bad for Sixers fans for what they're going through right now. Um, so. Yeah, I was pretty. I was at a zoo, and I was really happy to get that notification. I'm, I was relieved, but I I understand your yeah. your jubilation, guys. I'm just gonna say, no, I'm gonna. Mine was was relief as well. Relief that as was, well. Yeah, yeah. It was Mello's John g- who was doing cartwheels. I'm I'm giving Mello his flowers when I he comes up on the New York uh, top seventy five players thing that I'm mm-hmm. doing in the newsletter. He's going to be a lot higher than people than some people will want him. Um, and I don't feel bad about it because he's earned it, but I'm just, I'm never going to lie about how I felt about the guy towards the end of his tenure here. That's Understood. Cool. And we, we've, we've had this, this conversation many a time. You even, yep. we've had it with our mutual friend, Mr. Ozerowski on here, who feels even stronger about yes. the guy's tenure than, than you do. Um, can I have a sports radio minute for you guys? Cause you- this Isaiah Stewart, LeBron James incident okay. that just happened. This isn't, this might be an extended producer's corner if we have to. It's an off court incident. So I guess technically it happened down the court, but like that doesn't happen to Michael Jordan, right? Like no one's, did, did anybody ever try to go after Michael Jordan during an altercation or was the league so aware sure of the did. stature that, so what's the case? What's the incident? Cause I was trying to think of, wasn't Lamar- it? Wasn't it uh, Xavier McDaniel in, in the 92 playoffs? Pretty sure. Did that happen? I didn't know. Okay. So there is a Knicks moment that it happened. So oh, there were, I think there were a few Knicks dust ups in which Jordan was involved, but I, I, I don't here, but here's the, here's why. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to get in trouble. Um, here's why that shit never would have happened in the way it did with Jordan, because Jordan wouldn't wouldn't have needed half a fucking stadium of people to come between him and the guy that was going after him. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't have backed away in the first place because yeah. that's not what Michael Jordan would have done. LeBron James isn't Michael Jordan. He never will be. That that's the line I was going for. I'm gonna there. There's your latest viral clip, John. That Lakers Twitter will find and be very upset with. 
Oh, please. Lakers Twitter can go fuck themselves. That's the other viral clip that Lakers Twitter will find. <laughs> Good show today, guys. Uh, mm. Good show today, guys. <laughs> they said five. Yeah, five. I had, that's I, another one. You should leave that in. There. That's that's JFK. Not, this is where old. editing comes in. Oh, shout out JFK. Happy. No, this is no nope. more things getting cut. Yeah, I'm not ha- happy. Sean, how about your episode? Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to me. <laughs> Do what the doctors couldn't. With- <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I broke my promise. I'm sorry. It was. It's right there. Oh, you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. We appreciate your patronage, and we hope you come back for more with another episode very soon. Don't forget, subscribe, rate, and review so other people can enjoy this fine, fine content on their preferred podcast platform as well. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Over and out. Oh my God, Jeremy, that was so good. <laughs> uh.